Chicago will have a new mayor. April 4th, voters heading back to the polls for a runoff election. And here to talk about where things went wrong for the seven hopefuls who didn't make it. And looking ahead to what's next for the final two standing, Tonia Hill, journalist for the tribe, and Jacoby Cochran, host of City Cash Chicago. So glad to see you. Where do we even start? There is so much to talk about, right? Excited yes. to be here with you. So, yes. Tonia, let's start with you. Um, mm -hmm. And we got to start with the incumbent loss for Mayor Lightfoot. Surprised, not surprised at all. What did you make of it? I was maybe not so surprised, just like, I know we're not supposed to pay close attention to polls because they're skewed, but I feel like the polls were kind of leading that. I was surprised. What I was surprised about is that she called it so early. Right. With there being, you know, thousands of ballots still um, needing to be counted and things like that. So that was surprising to me that she called it so early. But seeing Brandon Johnson kind of surge, you know, from the start of this year to now has been kind of remarkable to see. Yeah, he surged at just the right time. Uh, Jacoby, what do you think went wrong with Lori Lightfoot when you look at four years ago, she won in the runoff against yeah. Preckwinkle. She won every ward in Chicago. Um, a lot of people were really excited that she would bring some change to the city. Of course, there were a lot of critics at that time. Yeah. Um, but what happened? I think one of the things Mayor Lori Lightfoot failed to do was to really get out ahead and control the narrative about her administration in the four years. We understand it was a very difficult four years from the uprisings after the killing of George Floyd to the pandemic. Every mayor, every governor across America had a really uh, hard challenge ahead of them. And unfortunately, Mayor Lightfoot just couldn't keep sort of good faith with the majority of Chicagoans. It's, it's really hard to go from sort of being unknown to being the person in power and characterizing yourself as someone who's still connected to the people, still listening. And it feels like that narrative that the mayor was someone who was hard to work with, someone who didn't keep her original campaign uh, promises and was unable to really uh, build a, a coalition not only within city council but across the city uh, really came to, to bite her at the end. After the results came in Tuesday night I had a conversation with the city treasurer Melissa Conyers Irvin mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. was uh, really fired up and disappointed basically saying that we expected Lori Lightfoot to fix 40 years of problems in yeah. four years. Uh, she felt that there there was an issue with the fact that you know you have two female mayors who are denied mm -hmm. a second term. What do you make of that? And what is the role? Did her identity as a black woman, uh, as a member of the LGBTQ community, did that play into this at all, do you think, Tonia? I feel like there's some nuances like to unpack that whole thing. I think to a degree I get what um, Treasurer Irvin was saying, like she's a black woman, Jane Byrne, you know, first female, pre I mean, mayor of mm -hmm. Chicago. Um, but, you know, daily, Rahm Emanuel, they got multiple chances. And some of the black voters that we talked to on election day at the tribe, you know, a lot of people, black voters were saying, I want to give her another chance. And you can kind of see that with how the majority black wards played out with voting. She won all the majority black wards. So most black people in you know, in the majority of black wards in Chicago were willing to give her a, a second chance. Yeah. So maybe that didn't necessarily, wasn't the case for the support that she had the first time around in 2019. Hmm. Okay, so now we have a matchup of Paul Vallis mm -hmm. and Brandon Johnson. I know Tonya said, uh, you know, reference Brandon Johnson's remarkable rise from relatively unknown mm -hmm. uh, to go ahead and capture the second seat. A lot of people know Paul Vallis. He was mm -hmm. former CPS CEO. Uh, he has run for office many, many times. What kind of campaign do you expect from him, Jacoby? Uh, I honestly think he'll stick to uh, the campaign tag that he has thus far. He's made public safety, and particularly public safety that centers police in the conversation, sort of been his bread and butter. And when you look at the breakdown of the way wards and precincts voted, you saw that a lot of individuals on the northwest side of the city, the southwest, southeast, places where you see individuals being 
more supportive of police uh, and, and police policy in this city sort of concentrated. You see Paul Vallis winning there, uh, and, and it's a, a likelihood that he's going to stay there. But you did see in his speech, uh, sort of after he was named the, the, the lead vote getter, that he is trying to paint himself as a more moderate Democrat by focusing on things like LGBTQ rights, uh, the empowerment of women, that he wants to talk with communities. Uh, but I don't think a, a lot of people on sort of the, the left progressive side of things are buying that. Right, they, they've always painted Paul Vallis as some sort of a Republican in Democrats' clothing, and I don't know if he really has the time or even the desire to push back against that narrative and we'll really just try to, to get that next 17% because he, he's almost there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we have to put out the disclaimer. We know that black voters are not a monolith, mm -hmm. of course. but uh, I'm wondering what you think. How do you think black voters will respond to Paul Vallis? Uh, there was some reporting from the Tribune that at some of his rallies, he was saying, you know, we're going to take our city back, which some people, you know, hear that and they say, oh, that's a dog whistle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you think black voters will respond to him? I think there is a real fear. Um, with like crime and safety in our communities and you know like that are still grappling with those things so I think he's appealing to that you know people just want to be safe but at the same time I think that black voters sometimes older are very conservative in how they vote um, some of them like really were supportive of Willie Wilson for example so I think those two camps of him like black conservatives are kind of aligning, will align themselves with like Paul Vallis um, or even the voters who supported Willie Wilson. Like will they come and now move on to Paul Vallis because Willie Wilson and Paul Vallis, you know, have a friendship and, and a history. And that's where we have to get into this conversation about endorsements because yeah. I think when you have uh, this many candidates in the first round of the race, um, each picking up thousands of votes, who they tell their supporters mm -hmm. to go ahead and support will matter mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. next round. Willie Wilson, uh, what about Lori Lightfoot? Exactly. What about Jesus Chuy mm -hmm. Garcia? Where do you think people will line up, uh, whether it's behind Vallis or Johnson or perhaps not at all? Mm. That's very interesting. I, I imagine a few people will probably keep their cars closer to the chest. When you think about Governor Pritzker, he's been very hushed throughout this process. When we start thinking about some of those other candidates who fell off, you already see Jamal Green trying to leverage uh, his momentum to see who's going to call me, who's going to be the person to get my endorsement. And when you look at a lot of those wards that Lori Lightfoot won, Brandon Johnson was running second. And so will she in many ways sort of look back at those wards and say, well, it seems that this is maybe where the people favor second. Uh, or, or will she consider how she sort of came at both of these candidates yeah, that's throughout a, the process? Because she did not point. pull punches. That's a good uh, point. And in a lot of the wards where Jesus Chuy Garcia, the congressperson, won, uh, a lot of those second place votes went to, to Paul Vallis. And mm -hmm. so, so I, those endorsements will mean a lot moving forward because name recognition matters. I, I know a lot of people in my own family who said, honestly, I don't know who's running. I don't plan on voting until there's a runoff. And, and so now, you know, I, I'm interested to see if they will just sort of go with who the majority of big name endorsements uh, tell them to go with. Recently mm -hmm. retired uh, Secretary of State Jesse White says he is supporting Paul Vallis. You think that could uh, make some waves? I think so. In the runoff? I think so because um, Jesse, Jesse White has this long, you know, history, like established political career. Yeah. And he was the incumbent secretary of state, you know, for the majority of my life. <laughs> so the most liked politician yeah. in Illinois for the majority of our right. lives, apparently. Mm -hmm. So I I see his his endorsement meaning taking some weight, um, for sure. Last thing, uh, Jacoby, really quickly, what does Brandon Johnson have to do to uh, capture enough votes to surpass Paul Vallis, do you think? Uh, I think, one, he has to continue with the nuance that he's provided already in his campaign. Uh, two, I think he needs to, to get out and continue what he's been doing. Over the last few weeks, I think his surge had a lot to do with the organizing community mm -hmm. in our city. You saw Brandon Johnson sitting down uh, with local TV shows. You saw Brandon Johnson sitting down with local radio shows and local podcasts. And if he can kind of bring some of that momentum over the next five weeks, I think we could see that rise continue. Very interesting. What a good conversation. Glad to have you both here with us. You can find Tonia's reporting and her coverage of the mayoral runoff at thetribe.com. That's tribe with two eyes. And you can hear Jacoby every day on City Cash Chicago.